When we have a field of any kind, we can define something called a flux. We could do this with the electric field, and in the calc-based course, we do it because we need it for something called Gauss's law. We don't use Gauss's law in this course because essentially you need vector calculus for that again. Anyway, to define a flux, it's a product of area and field and the orientation between them. So if you look at this picture from your textbook, you can see you have this flat tan plate that represents the area you're interested in. And we say the direction of that area is perpendicular to it. So this line here that goes straight up and down, that's the normal to A. We want to find the dot product between the B field and A. So it's B times the size of the area times the cosine of the angle between them. This lets us define a magnetic flux. And a way, another way you can think about this is if you imagine you're trying to catch fish in a river with a net. The size of the net is like the tan square. The larger the area, the better chance of catching fish, the more flux. The faster the river, that would mean a, a larger value of B, that pulls more fish past your point and you are more likely to catch something there. If you hold the net the wrong way, there, you know that there's a way you could hold it where all the river goes parallel to the mouth of it and no, no fish would ever have a chance of getting in there. So that's the cosine theta part. To maximize your chance of catching a fish, you'd have fast river, big net, and you'd hold it the right way. Now, the reason we care about magnetic flux is it explains a result that's been odd for a very long time. We take a galvanometer, which is essentially a very sensitive ammeter, and connect it to a few turns of wire, and of course it sits on zero because there's nothing to push a current through it. If we now take a magnet and push it through the loop of wire, we get a current, but as soon as the magnet stops moving, the current disappears. We pull the magnet out of the loop, we get a current moving the other way. The only time the galvanometer moves is when the magnet is moving, so there's only a current when the magnet is moving. Now, we can also move the wire and hold the magnet still, and it looks exactly the same. This one we can explain easily enough because we know we have a force on these charges, which is F equals QV cross B, because the electrons in the wire are moving through the B field when we move the loop. So they get pushed around the circuit, they make a current. We don't have an explanation for what happens when we hold the wire still and move the magnet, though, because the charges shouldn't be responding to the magnetic field. Right? If we're holding the wires still and let the magnet move, we have no velocity. Faraday was the first one to discover this, and his explanation for it is that the change in flux is what matters. Einstein used the same experiment to show that it doesn't matter which one moves because of relative motion being the only significant thing. That's where the relativity in theory of relativity comes from. There's no such thing as absolute motion. It's only motion measured relative to something else. That's all that's important. So if we look at Faraday's law of induction, the way he explains this, he says that we get an EMF, E, epsilon. And remember, this is like a battery voltage, right? It's something that will push charges around. We get this EMF from a changing magnetic flux phi which looks like this if we have n loops. It's negative n change in phi over change in time. The fact that there's a negative sign here, that has a name all by itself. That's Lenz's law. It says whichever way we change the magnetic flux, the circuit is going to try and counteract that change. It will produce something that will do its best to fight whatever the change is, and that's why the sign is negative. It doesn't cooperate with us, it fights us. So our unit for magnetic flux, this thing, is Tesla's times meters squared, or Weber's. Again, capital letter because it's someone's name. The common example for this, this phenomenon, we say we have two parallel conducting rails, we'll say they're perfectly conducting to make life easy. And we can put a resistor between them so we have a known resistance for the whole path made by the two rails and this bar that rides on them and the resistor. We've got a magnetic field going through the region where the rails are. What happens if we pull this vertical bar to the right? If you look at that, 
Of course, we're not changing the field, but we're changing the area that the field goes through. So that means we're changing the flux. And in this case, we're, have, we're increasing the amount of flux into the page because you can see the little feathered tail of the arrow here. This X means the B field's going into the page. So we are increasing in the page flux when we do this. Lenz's law says the circuit is going to respond by trying to fight that change, and it's going to try and decrease the in the board flux. The way to do this is to get a magnetic field coming out of the page. So take your right hand, hold it up in front of you. If your thumb points towards your face out of the page, your fingers curl around this way. So this says we're going to have a counterclockwise current produced when we pull this bar to the side like this. This is our induced EMF and it drives an induced current. How big is this EMF? Well, we have our formula. Here we just have n equals 1. We only have a single loop. We don't have lots and lots of turns of wire. If we say the distance between the rails is L and we call the distance left and right X, we already know what direction we're going to have so we can actually ignore the negative sign. We've worked it out uh, worked it out from physical principles rather than mathematical principles. So we get that the EMF is delta phi over delta t, and phi, remember, is b times a times cosine theta. Well, b and a are parallel here, so cosine theta will be 1. So delta b a over delta t is the same thing as delta b l times x over delta t. Now, B doesn't change, L doesn't change. The only thing that changes is X. So we can take B and L out of this little parentheses and write BL delta X delta T. But since last semester, we've known delta X delta T is V. Again, keep in mind, V is velocity of the bar. It's a lowercase V. It's not a capital V voltage. This is what represents our, our potential, our voltage. The current comes from Ohm's law which is just voltage over R or epsilon over R or BLV over R. So this tells us how big the current will be. If we wanted to find the power dissipated in this resistance, we'd say, okay, it's I times V. So this times this, which gives us BL velocity all squared over R. Now, why did we need the negative sign in this uh, in this explanation. I mean, we, we reasoned it away, but it was still there. Why do we have it? The reason is our induced current, which is moving counterclockwise, is moving up through this bar, right? If it goes around like that, it's got to be moving up the page through that bar. So it's carrying a current, and we want to know what's the force on that current. We've got a magnetic field, and we've got a current, so we can do the right-hand rule, point your fingers up, curl them into the page and you'll see that you get a force to the left because of this induced current. If that force went to the right, it would make the bar move even faster. So as soon as you gave this bar a little bump to the right, it would just keep gathering speed and go faster and faster. And of course that would violate conservation of energy. So it has to be something that reduces the velocity you're applying to it. This force has to fight you rather than help you. Now we can figure out if we move the bar back to the left, what happens? Well, now we're starting to cut off in the page flux. So the circuit tries to produce in the page flux. Point the thumb of your right hand into the page and you'll see your fingers curl counterclockwise. So if you move the, the bar the other way, the current goes the other way. If the current moves clockwise, it's moving down through the bar, and the force on it will, of course, be to the right. How big is this force? We know it's ILB sine theta. Theta is 90 degrees here. So we've got I, which is BLV, times L times B. So we can write it like this, BL squared, little v over R. What power do we need to move a, the bar at a constant velocity, V, against this force F. This is from last semester. It's F dotted into velocity. When we do that, when we take this and multiply by another factor of velocity, we get BLV all squared over R. 
Notice that this power that we need to keep it moving, this is exactly the same as the power that's burned up in the resistor. So we don't have any frictional losses here the way we've designed it, which is not realistic, but we see that all of our effort goes into heating up that resistor. So this is the beginning of making a generator.